and see who's talking. All right. Um, today we are going to talk about perennials and grasses um, and some of the perennials and grasses that do well in Utah. Um, like Mike said, I work a lot with our plant database, and so I love all of the plants that we have in the garden, and it was really hard to pick and choose which ones to talk about today. So just because it's not in the PowerPoint doesn't mean that we don't like it um, or that it doesn't do well here. So um, a lot of my slides will have multiple um, varieties of a type of plant, but this one uh, I wanted to just throw up a slide of some spring bulbs that do well um, in Utah and kind of what they look like. So you can see some of maybe the different ones that you don't always see. Tulips are pretty common, hyacinths are pretty common, glory of the snow maybe not as common, and then the windflower um, is one that I really, really enjoy. I think it's really pretty, but I don't see it very often. So uh, there will be some that are, some plants in this that are pretty common and some that maybe you haven't seen as much before. All right, so we're going to start by talking about plants that do well in full sun. So full sun would be six hours of direct sunlight or more, um, generally. So the Soul Dancer Daisy is a really awesome plant. It is one of my favorites. It uh, doesn't take much water. Uh, once it's established, you don't have to water it at all if you don't want to. Um, and the fun fact about this plant is that this variety was developed at Utah State University um, and is really well adapted to our area and it blooms. Sometimes we see blooms in like February, more often March or April through October or sometimes November. It blooms all summer long and is just a beautiful plant and makes a great addition to any landscape. Phlox subulata is our next one. So these are more of your creeping phlox uh, varieties. So these are more of a ground cover. They, they only get two to six inches tall, um, but they can get one and a half to three feet wide. And they have a variety of different colors that they come in. Um, these are also beautiful plants. They bloom in the spring and uh, take moderate water. So for us, moderate water is being watered with drip irrigation once every seven to 10 days. So it's still not a ton of water, um, even though it says moderate. So just something to be aware of. Um, yeah, so the next one we're going to talk about is a GM. So there are different species here, uh, and you can see some of the different types of GM uh, pictured in this slide. And depending on the variety, depends on how tall and how wide it gets. The prairie smoke GM, for example, stays a lot shorter. Um, it's only about a half a foot tall, about six inches. Um, and that one is Utah native where the others are not, but they are beautiful plants and still do really well in the area. Um, and they can handle a little bit of shade or full sun. Uh, they also come in a variety of colors. And I just think this is a really beautiful plant with beautiful flowers. Um, that are a good addition to a landscape. And with the prairie smoke, the, the flowers are cool um, and the flower buds are cool, but the seed head is also cool. You can see a little bit of that kind of smoky um, seed head on that picture on the top left. So that is a 
great addition to any landscape as well. Variegated sweet iris. I love this plant. It is so cool. Um, I really like irises anyway, and then having one with variegated leaves is awesome. Um, so you can get it with white and green variegation or yellow and green variegation, and they both have purple flowers. Um, and the flowers have kind of an artificial grape smell. So it smells like grape Kool-Aid or um, like grape candy or uh, maybe some grape cough syrup or something. Um, so that can be kind of a fun thing for, for people to smell as well. Um, and even when this isn't blooming, because irises only bloom for a short amount of time, the variegated leaves still add texture and color to the landscape. They also use low water, which for us would be water every, maybe once every two weeks um, or so with that. Yeah, once every 10 to 14 days. All right, so the silver-edged whorehound, this one is actually kind of cool. I just was looking more closely at the flowers yesterday. They're white, but pretty inconspicuous. Um, in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see what it looks like with flowers on it. Um, so they don't really stand out very much, but the bees, as I was looking at it yesterday, were just covering it. They were really enjoying the flowers. Um, so it's good for pollinators, and it also is evergreen, um, which can add interest to the landscape throughout the seasons. And um, yeah, the the silver edge on the leaves can add some good dimension and color as well. All right, peonies, probably something at least most of you are familiar with. Um, they come in a wide variety of colors and heights and um, kind of styles of bloom. So there are some that are single um, petaled and then some that are a lot more full. They have a variety of different colors like the sorbet um, peony in the top right corner has some pink petals at the base and then a row of white petals and then pink, pinky purple petals at the top as well. Um, so they, they are so fun and make great cut flowers as well. Um, they work in the sun to part shade. Uh, they may not bloom as well in the part in partial shade, but they generally still will live. Um, but you typically get better flowers in the sun. Oriental poppies. So these are beautiful flowers um, when they're blooming. The rest of the time, they the greens look a little bit weedy sometimes, but then they flower and the flower is just totally worth it. Um, they come in orange, pink, red. Um, there may be some other colors as well, but those are the ones that we have at the garden. Um, and they take low to moderate water and um, are a good addition to the landscape just with the, the color and texture that they provide. Blue oak grass. So this is a wonderful evergreen grass that does not take much maintenance. It's very low maintenance and will live in the sun to part shade. It also has a nice blue green color um, and then is really easy to maintain because in the spring you just take a rake and just rake out the dead and then that's all you have to do with it um, and it just looks beautiful the rest of the year. Garden gnome. This is one that I just learned about when we got it in the garden um, a couple of years ago. 
And so it is just a cute little ground cover that I think is just adorable. Um, the buds are kind of fun because they're they're kind of red in the bud form and then the backs of the petals are red. So when they close up, you see more of the red. Um, but then when they're open, the top of the flower is white. So that is super fun as well. Dwarf blue sea holly. So sea holly, uh, my background is in floral design and we used sea holly a lot in floral arrangements. Um, so this makes a great cut flower. It also uses very little water. Um, the plant is a little bit pokey, uh, but you just cut it down once a year and then you don't really have to deal with it after that. So um, if you just put on gloves and a long sleeve shirt, it's a breeze to take care of and adds a fun, kind of unique texture to the landscape. Penstemons. I love penstemons. Um, I didn't know much about penstemons until I started working at the garden. Um, but there is such a variety in penstemons. They come in all sorts of different colors and heights and widths, and you can pretty much find one to fill any purpose in your landscape. Um, they, depending on the variety, they can be eight inches tall to five feet tall. Um, and they take very low to low water. So if you water them at all, it would be once every 10 to 14 days. Um, but once they're established, they can generally survive without any supplemental water. Um, there are also a several varieties that are native to Utah. Ice plants. Oh, I also love ice plants. Um, they're just so fun and the flowers are kind of like metallic and shiny, uh, which is fun. And they take very low water. They also come in a big variety of colors. Um, there are peach flowers, there are lavender colored flowers, um, as well as the purple, the yellow, um, the white. There are some variegated ones like the fire spinner um, shown in, in this slide. There are just so many cool types of ice plant. Um, and yeah, they're just super fun. I really like them. Anyway. Ornamental onions. <clears throat> okay, so these are your alliums. Um, they are grown more for their flower, and they also come in a wide range of heights. They also come in a range of bloom times. So some are blooming now, but then once they're done, some another variety of allium will start blooming. And then when those are done, another one will start blooming. And so there's a section here at the garden where we have a bunch of different types of alliums and they something is blooming pretty much all season um and they come in a variety of colors pinks purples whites yellows and some have even kind of a greenish um green aspects to them and they do well in sun to part shade and with low water Okay, sedums. These are <coughs> a fun plant. They get two to eight inches tall. So these are more of your ground cover sedums. Um, two to eight inches tall by six to 24 inches wide. Um, they need very little water and grow best in full sun. Um, they also have some pretty fun blooms, and depending on the variety, depends on what time of year they bloom as well. All right, so here we have a few different types of salvias. Um, so with these, I was going more for like the um, more typical May night sage or salvia type of a feel, but there are many different types of salvias that also do well here um, that are not pictured on this slide. Um, 
no matter what plant you're getting, you want to make sure that it will do will survive in the zone where you live. So plant tags will, will generally have a zone or a temperature range um, where they will survive. Um, it's generally like a, a cold um, lower limit. And so there are some salvias that only survive the winters in California or some warmer places. Um, and so no matter what plants you're getting uh, or what type of plant, you want to make sure that it survives in the area if you're going to put it in the ground. If you're going to put it in a decorative pot, um, then you could get some annuals that don't survive the winters. Um, but that's just something to be aware of as well. But these come in a variety of different colors um, and sizes and some of the, the Mayonite salvia, um, which is an older variety, tends to get a bit floppy um, and may not look quite as nice through some parts of the summer. But these are newer varieties that I'm showing on this slide that tend to stay more upright and um, look a little bit better. But when they're done blooming, you can just cut them to the base, um, leave maybe an inch or so above the soil surface, and then they will grow back and rebloom um, in the same year. Creeping time. So this, these are times that are generally not used for culinary purposes, although they can be um, used for cooking. They just may have different flavors or maybe not as strong of a flavor. So there's a variety in different bloom colors as well in generally the pink, purple to red um, range. They like the sun to part shade and can handle some light foot traffic. Um, if you have a sunny spot, it can be, and you don't want to put lawn there, it can be a good lawn alternative. Cat mint. So these also come in a variety of different sizes and widths. Um, and they are always coming out with new varieties of all sorts of different plants, including the cat mints. Uh, the one in the top right corner, cat's pajamas, that is one that we just got last year in the garden. And it is a beautiful plant. Um, it has very little green uh, at the base compared to the size of the blooms. So that is a fun newer variety um, that we have been trying in the garden. These do well in sun to part shade. Um, there are some more low growing varieties and some that are more upright as well. Daylilies. Ooh, daylilies. Um, I really like daylilies. I think they're super fun. They are also edible. Um, so you can eat the flowers and depending on the color depends on kind of the flavor and how crisp they are. Um, some taste better than others, um, but they are all edible. Um, they take low to moderate water and can survive in the sun to part shade. Again, they'll generally bloom better in the full sun. They come in a wide variety of different bloom colors and with lots of different variations on, um, color combinations within flowers as well. Red birds in a tree. Okay, this is one that you may have never heard of before, but I just think it's fun. And so I had to share it with you guys. So this is related to a penstemon um, and it is just super fun. It has these little red flowers that kind of look like birds in a tree. Um, and it takes low water and blooms June through September um, and does well in the full sun. Red hot pokers. So these also come in a variety of colors, um, despite the name red. And 
in the title. Uh, so they come in red, yellow, orange, white, um, kind of peach and cream. They are low to moderate water users and bloom June through September. Some of the newer varieties will bloom that whole time, where some of the older varieties you may only get one set of blooms or maybe two. Um, but some of the newer varieties bloom a lot longer, um, which is a fun addition to the landscape. Fountain grass. So these also come in a variety of different sizes, depending on which variety you get. Um, so they, the, the varieties that we have in the garden range from one to three feet tall uh, by one and a half to three feet wide, and they grow in sun to park shade. Um, and so it says that they bloom June through August, but on pretty much all of these ornamental grasses, they will um, still have some interest with their blooms throughout the winter into the next spring. Coneflowers. These are super fun as well. Um, they come in all sorts of different colors. Uh, I'm always seeing new varieties in plant catalogs, um, which is super fun. They take low water and can bloom June through September. Um, and they do well in the sun to part shade. Um, and there are some varieties like the Cheyenne Spirit in the bottom right corner that, um, can have different colors on the same plant, or if you get multiple plants, they may each be a different color. So they just, the Cheyenne Spirits can range in purple, pink, red, yellow, orange, um, which is kind of fun. Hardy hibiscus. This is another plant that I was introduced to when I started working at the garden. Um, I did not know that they, there was such a thing as a hardy hibiscus, also sometimes called a dinner plate hibiscus. Um, and these have a range of colors as well, generally in the pink to red to white range. And they survive in the sun to part shade. Um, they like a little bit more water, so they're more in the moderate water range. Um, if you give them more water, they, they like that, but they, they will still do well on water once every seven to 10 days. Um, they, again, generally bloom a little bit better in the full sun. Black-eyed Susans. So these, um, I used to get confused a lot between these and the coneflowers, um, but these are yellow. The Black Eyed Susans are yellow generally, um, at least the ones that are hardy here that I've seen. Um, and they bloom June through October with moderate water use. Uh, we have a spot in the garden where if something goes wrong with the irrigation, um, the Black Eyed Susans are the first ones to tell us that they're struggling and want some water. They, they tend to wilt a little bit faster than a lot of the other varieties in that area. Um, but as soon as they get water, they perk back up and are just fine. The reed grasses. So these may look pretty um, familiar to a lot of you. Uh, the Carl Forester is one that is very commonly used in landscapes, um, but on this I, I wanted to also point out that there are a couple of other varieties, Overdam and Eldorado, that have variegated leaves um, and generally stay a little bit shorter than the Carl Forester, um, but the varieg variegated leaf can add a different dimension to um, the grass as well. Goldenrod. This is also one that does well as a cut flower. Um, and depending on the variety, depends on the height again. So the golden baby and little lemon will stay a little bit shorter than the fireworks. Um, it takes low water, does best in full sun, but can handle a little bit of shade. Uh, it blooms yellow and 
generally like more midsummer to fall on the blooms for these, which is fun. Stone crops. So this is a more upright sedum. So earlier we talked about ground cover sedums. Um, these are taller sedums, 18 to 24 inches tall and wide. Uh, they have pink blooms, but as you can see in the picture, they have different shades of pink um, to kind of more red um, in their blooms. And they bloom more in the fall. They also take low water um, and can survive in a little bit of shade as well. Maximilian sunflowers. These are super fun because they get six to 10 feet tall um, and get uh, relatively small sunflowers all down the stems. They're still decent sized flowers, but considering the height of the stalk, they're not huge, um, but they are a great addition to a landscape. They bloom September through October, so they're a much later um, blooming plant, and they take low to moderate water, um, and they do best in the full sun. Um, in the shade, they might get a little bit more floppy. Uh, the stalks might fall over a little bit more, um, but they generally survive with a little bit of shade as well. Single apricot chrysanthemum. This bloomed super well my first year um, as a full-time employee at the garden, and it was super fun because I had heard about them before when I was an intern, but I had always had to go back to school, and so it it was really fun to see them actually bloom. Um, and they just got covered in these beautiful pink blooms. Um, they do take moderate water and survive in full sun. Um, and they bloom October through November if the frost doesn't kill them. Um, if, if the frost doesn't kill the flower buds. Um, so they are a beautiful plant. And it's, it's hit and miss on if we get a good bloom or not. It all depends on the weather. But even on, on the years that you don't get a good bloom, um, it's okay because you know that there's going to be a year where it's just going to be covered and you're going to get this awesome um, plant uh, that's going to look so cool in your landscape. Blonde Ambition Blue Grama. So this is another really cool grass. Um, it gets kind of unique seed heads on it, which add um, good variety and texture throughout um, the, the season and through the winter. Um, and yeah, they're just a super fun grass that is a little bit smaller. It's about two feet tall by one and a half feet wide. Here's another grass, the undaunted ruby muley grass. Not all muley grasses survive very well here, um, but this one does okay. And it has these beautiful airy pink to red blooms um, that appear in the fall. And it takes low water and likes the sun. Uh, we do have it in a couple areas in the garden where it gets a little bit of shade, um, but generally they like full sun. All right, now we're going to move on to part shade to shade plants. So part shade we would consider to be four to six hours of direct sunlight and full shade would be four hours or less of direct sunlight. Um, and Lenten roses are a really good plant to have in those areas. Um, They're always coming out with new varieties of these. Some of the flowers are kind of droopy and hang down a little bit, and some of them are 
more upright and um, more visible. They come in a variety of different colors. These are a few that we have here at the garden, but um, if you Google them or go to a nursery, you'll find all sorts of different colors. Um, and they are really early bloomer. They bloom, um, depending on where you live, they could bloom February through May. Um, and the blooms on them last quite a while. Um, we've, the varieties that we have in the garden have been blooming for almost two months now. So their flowers last quite a while. Um, and then, uh, yeah, they do well in this shade to part shade. Bug loss. So these are a fun plant um, that I really enjoy. The variegated leaves add some color even when they're not blooming. These bloom April through May um, and they have these little blue flowers that are that remind me kind of a forget-me-nots. Um, and they they do tend to like a little bit more water, so moderate um to maybe high um they generally do okay with the moderate watering though which would be the ones every seven to ten days um and they yeah they're just a fun addition to the landscape and there's not a lot of flowers that come in blue um but that one is pretty blue okay so fragrant persian stonecrest is another fun perennial. Um, it has these really kind of unique pink blooms on them. Um, and then after they're done blooming, they get these seed heads, as like you can see in the top right picture. Um, and they, they still add some interest to the plant and the landscape. Uh, even when they're not blooming with that seed head, but they do like to spread by seed. Um, and so if you don't want them spreading, I would suggest deadheading them before they seed around too much. Uh, they're also not too hard to pull the little seedlings um, when they're small. Um, so that can be a fun addition to the landscape as well. Turkish speedwell, this is another lawn alternative. Um, it can handle very light foot traffic and has purple to blue blooms. Um, it blooms in May with low water and survives in the sun to part shade. Um, and when it's not blooming, it's just this nice carpet of green. You can see kind of what the foliage looks like in the top right hand corner. Next, we have a foxtail lily. Um, these are fun. They bloom May through June. They're just barely getting ready to bloom right now, and I'm super excited to see them again this year. Um, they come in orange, peach, yellow, cream, and red, um, and they do well in sun to part shade. Um, and with low water and they can get three to five feet tall. Uh, so they can add some fun height at that time of year um, when maybe some of the things growing around them are still trying to get some height on them. The Axminster Fold Comfrey. So this does well in sun to shade. Um, and it, um, the, the places that we have it growing at the garden are part shade to full shade, and they um, are really pretty and have these really unique flowers that are kind of in this spiral pattern, and there's two rows of them on each, um, like, flower stalk. Um, so that's kind of unique. I think that's fun. And then the flowers being very, sorry the flowers the leaves being variegated adds interest even when the flower the plant is not blooming 
coral bells. I love coral bells. They're so cool. Um, these come in a variety of different leaf colors. So their blooms are generally pink or white, um, but their leaf color uh, and shape changes depending on the variety. So here you can see several different varieties. So um, they, some of the leaves are more lobed, some of them are more crinkly, um, they come in all sorts of different colors. And um, so even when they're not blooming, they can add a lot of color and texture uh, and interest to shady areas. Corn flowers. These are so cool too. I, I think that just like their shape of the flower is really unique and fun. Um, the pollinators also really like them. They grow in part sun to shade and with low water and um, come in purple, white, blue, or pink. And they bloom May through August. They tend to get a heavier bloom in the spring and then sporadic through the rest of the summer. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some plants that do well in sun to shade and are pretty adaptable to whatever um, light they are given. So first we have Pasque flower. It blooms in March through April, but after it's done blooming, you can see the seed heads in the bottom right corner, um, which adds some interest as well to the landscape. They also, when they're not blooming and the seed heads are cut down, um, the foliage adds some interest and then um, can be cut down once it uh, doesn't look good anymore. And then um, something else can come in and take its spot. But this is a really fun plant um, that I think is really pretty and is one of the first things to bloom in the spring. So Bort, this is a good option if you have a rock wall or um, want a ground cover. Um, it will seed around as well, but again, it's pretty easy to remove if you don't want it to spread. Um, you can also deadhead it, uh, but it just is really pretty and um, covers a, a rock wall very well and um, really stands out. It is a beautiful plant. Sea thrift. So this is a, another fun one. It is evergreen um, and the leaves look kind of like grass. It comes in pink um, generally, but there is a white, white variety as well. Um, they um, bloom in the sp late spring, so May through June, and then they'll sporadically get a couple of blooms uh, throughout the rest of the summer. They do well in sun to shade and um, could potentially be used as another lawn alternative. Um, if you're not going to walk on it much, if it's just kind of a, a central open shape space holder, um, that could be a fun uh, option for that. Now we're going to talk about some spurge. Spurge tends to have a negative connotation because there are a lot of weeds um, called spurge. And yes, these are related, but they tend to have more visual interest and not spread as much. Um, the cushion spurge in the top left picture in this slide, we have seen move around some, um, but again, if you're just out there uh, pretty often in your landscape, then it's pretty easy to control where it's at. Um, if you deadhead it, it also helps prevent um, spreading as much. The Ascot Rainbow Spurge is a great plant. It has a variegated leaf and is evergreen. 
Um, the top right picture is the flower that comes on the Ascot Rainbow Spurge, but even when it's not blooming, it still looks awesome. And, and these come in a variety of different foliage colors as well. So we already talked about peonies, but here are some Ito peonies, which are a cross between um, a kind of a more standard peony and a tree peony. So they have um, generally less petals um, than the more typical herbaceous peony. Uh, and the stalks are sturdier. They stay more upright without needing to be staked. Um, and they come in a variety of colors and have really pretty blooms um, and are a fun addition to the landscape as well. Cranesbill. So these are geraniums, but they, so when you're buying plants, word of caution, um, if you can, use the botanical name or the scientific name to buy plants. Um, there are common names change based on the area or who you're talking to. Um, and there is an annual plant that doesn't survive the winters that is has the common name of geranium. This is not that. This does survive the winter. Um, the botanical name is geranium, and then the, it's often called crane's bill. So it comes in a variety of colors, pink to white to purple to blue, um, and it can be a fun addition to the landscape. It does also like to seed around, but again, it's pretty easy to control where it's at. Um, in the top right hand, corner is the bloody cranes bill um, and it has a purple flower but in the fall the leaves turn red. Um, geraniums also tend to be semi evergreen so they'll have a few leaves that um, stay green through the winter and then parts of it will die as well. Desert four o'clock. So oh Going back to the cranes bill, some of them are Utah natives as well, um, if that's something that you are interested in. Desert four o'clock, this is also a Utah native. It is generally um, found in purple, but occasionally you can find a white variety. Um, these do well in sun to full shade, they get five to eight feet wide. If you don't water them, they'll get like four to five feet wide. And, but if you do water them, they'll get more like eight feet wide. Um, and they bloom June through September. The flowers close up during the day and open in the evening. Um, and they use very little water and will survive almost anywhere. We have some that are growing under some pine trees um, in the garden where not much else wants to grow. Chocolate flower. This is a fun one. Um, I remember learning about this in school uh, where when I studied hort horticulture in college and um, one of my professors was like, yeah, there's this flower that smells like chocolate. And I was like, yeah, right. Like, Flowers aren't going to smell like chocolate. This flower smells like chocolate. Um, more like uh, cocoa powder. And it is a fun addition to the landscape. Um, in the bottom right hand picture, you can see what it looks like after it's done flowering as well. Um, with these little brown discs and the green discs as well. Um, and so even when the flowers die, they still look pretty attractive. Um, it also uses very little water and can survive in sun to shade. Maiden grass. So these are another ornamental grass. 
um, that depending on the variety depends on the size. So you can get some that are two feet tall um, and others that are up to eight feet tall um, and two to six feet wide. They um, bloom August through October, depending on the variety. Um, some of them have variegated leaves like the gold bar and the zebra grass um, in this picture. And they take low to moderate water and will survive in the sun to shade. Um, and they, the, the seed heads um, can be good food for birds over the winter um, and can also add some interest and movement through the winter to your landscape. All right, so those were the plants I wanted to talk about, but just because I wanted to show you a few more pictures of some different plant combinations and how things can be put together in a landscape. So here, all of these are from the garden. Um, so here's a gold bar maiden grass with a summer storm hardy hibiscus. And then there's a mugo pine in the top uh, left hand corner. Um, so that is kind of a fun color combination with the purple leaves on the hibiscus and the pink flowers and then the variegated uh, maiden grass. Here is another combination that's actually blooming right now um, with the avalanche white sun daisy and then the little Trudy cat mint. Um, this white and purple color combination is fun. And then there are a couple of evergreens in the background. So this is the soap wart growing on a rock wall. Um, so you can kind of see what that looks like and, and how it really accents that. Um, and then the variegated sweet iris is in there as well. Here is the amethyst and snow cornflower. Um, and then with a pine leaf penstemon down in this uh, towards the bottom right corner. Um, and that is a fun variety of penstemon. This was taken at ground level. Um, so that cornflower is probably only a foot and a half to two feet tall. Uh, and the penstemon is about 10 to 12 inches tall. So here's the Soul Dancer Daisy with the Little Trudy Catmint. Um, so that is also a really fun color combination, the purple and the yellow. Um, so that is in our new local scapes exhibit at the garden. And then this is uh, the last one I wanted to show you guys with the Husker red penstemon kind of in the foreground in the right side, and then the sticky purple geranium in the opposite corner, um, and then the rock candy purple penstemon and the coral canyon twin spur. Um, all of these plants and a lot of others can be found on our website, conservationgardenpark.org, um, under the find plants tab. Um, and there's lots more information about all of them and where they can be used in your landscape. They're also uh, on display here at the garden. Um, feel free to come by and visit us and ask us questions and look at the plants um, and get some ideas for your landscape. And with that, um, do we have any questions, Mike? We, we do have a few questions. Uh... Uh, I, I I told you guys, uh, uh, Natalie's enthusiasm for this really shines through. So, but yeah, I do have a couple of questions. So I'm actually going to put you on the spot just a little bit. Uh, if you had to pick your favorite flower here, what would it be? <laughs> I don't know. It depends on what I'm looking at at the time and what's blooming. Um, I really like the Soul Dancer daisies just uh -huh. because they do bloom for so long and um, can be used pretty much anywhere. They're really adaptable. Um, so I really like those. Just a, um, just a cheery little plant. What? Just a cheery little plant. Yeah, yeah. They're really fun. And the hardy hibiscus. I love those. 
They're so Thank cool. You cool. Okay, we do have a couple questions that I want to run past you before we go. Um, talk a little bit about deer resistance um, uh, and maybe how you guys have come to the conclusion of what's deer resistant, what's not, or maybe how you kind of, you know, or, or something like that. So. Okay. Um, <laughs> Deer have become an increasing problem at the garden, so we are still trying to figure out some ways to um, get things established before the deer pull them out um, so that they can develop a root system and um, be able to outgrow uh, whatever the deer do to them. Um, but there are a lot of plants that are deer resistant. Um, on our plant finder on the database, um, we try to look at information from um, university extension services, um, and then also sometimes the um, nurseries and plant developer websites to see what they say about deer resistance. Um, just because it's deer resistant on the database doesn't mean that the deer won't eat it. It just means that it will recover from what the deer do. Um, so be a little bit patient if you're um, in an area that has a lot of deer and you're planting things like hostas, uh, we just planted some and we're going to put some small little cages around them so that they can get a root system before um, they get uh, attacked by the deer. Um, and then hopefully they'll be able to outgrow whatever damage they do get once they get a little bit bigger and more established. Deer, deer have become quite discouraged here. So, yes. Okay. Um, Somebody asked uh, a question of, you can get more than one bloom out of a salvia? Yes, yeah. you can. So we are actually currently this year making some different maintenance videos on um, how we take care of different things at the garden. And I believe that's one that we are going to do is um, how we maintain salvias. Um, so, Generally, you'll you'll get like a big flush of blooms um, right now, right now. Um, and then they'll kind of start to fade and you'll start getting a couple popping up that are um, coming up from the base that are new blooms. But by the time those come up, the first ones are kind of flopped over and kind of sad looking. And so we just cut the whole plant to the ground. Um, instead of going through and individually deadheading them. And then um, even if some of the blooms are just coming up, they still get cut down. And then we just let it regrow and we'll often get at least two blooms, sometimes three sets of blooms in the year when we do that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, someone asked how long that, uh, that silver edge whorehound blooms. Ooh, that's a good question. Um, it's not super noticeable, so I will admit that I'm not totally sure how long it blooms because you don't really notice it very much. Um, but it just started blooming within the last week or so, um, and I would expect it to finish blooming in another week or two. Um, a lot of plants generally bloom for one to three weeks, so yeah. I I would think it's somewhere in that range. I think it's probably right. Um, uh, somebody's asking about ice plant. Uh, they uh, start to get some of the ice plant going. And our ice plant looks pretty good out there. Um, so I'm guessing the the uh, the question really is about establishment watering on uh, on ice plant, but this probably goes for a lot of things. So yeah establishment watering is super super important and something that gets missed a lot um when you first put your plants in the ground you do need to baby them a little bit even the the ones that are hardy and don't need much maintenance um and so 
Um, first of all, before I get into that, it's okay that you have failed some. We have failed <laughs> many ice plants and many other plants. Um, there are a lot of factors that go into living plants and most of them you can't control. Um, and sometimes things just happen and plants don't make it. Um, and that's okay. It's just how nature works. Um, so don't feel bad, first of all. Um, and then, yeah, so with establishment watering, um, Mike just taught a class last Saturday um, about planting. He specifically talked about trees, but there's a section in there that talks about establishment watering, which applies to any plant, um, not just trees and shrubs. And a recording of that will be available on our YouTube channel um, in the next couple of weeks, probably. But just briefly, once if you plant it in the spring, I would say water it once every th two, probably once every two days, um, two to three days for the first while until it starts getting hot in the summer, um, 80, 85, 90 degrees and above, I would say water. Um, every other day uh, and keep an eye on them and if they look like they need water um, feel the soil around them because signs of overwatering and underwatering are the same and so if it's really dry around the plant and you want to check in the root ball not just the soil around um, you want to check where the roots actually are because um, sometimes that dries out faster than the soil around it um, so check that and water it um, as needed, and then you can kind of taper off in the fall. Nice. Um, so uh, somebody uh, asked the question um, about edible daylilies. About uh, they asked the specific question whether or not all parts of a daylily are edible. So mm -hmm. I know you probably don't know the answer to that question. So I went ahead and looked it up, and so I will go ahead and answer it if you'd like. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, to go along with the uh, the flowers, the buds, the stalks, and the tubers are all edible and quite tasty. So right, I've read that, and that the the flower buds taste like green beans. Right, I think is what so, I read. Turns out when I googled it up, there are there are like small there are websites dedicated to uh, daylilies being an edible crop. So that was pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. Actually, yeah. it's pretty cool. So uh, thank okay. you for the question. So, uh, so uh, one last one last question. Um, well, okay, maybe maybe two. Uh, Pensamens, short lived, long lived. Um, it depends on the variety. Sometimes, if you let them seed around, they last longer. Um, yeah, I would recommend not deadheading them, letting them seed around because they do tend to be a little bit shorter lived perennial. Yep. Um, and uh, do you have a general preference about mulch, whether it's uh, like an organic or or like a uh, um, a gravel inorganic type of mulch? So it depends on your purpose. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages to both. Organic mulches, you do have to keep adding more mulch every year or every couple of years because it works itself into the soil, um, which benefits the soil, but you do have to oh. refresh it. Uh, with gravel or the inorganic mulch, you don't have to ever refresh it, but it also doesn't improve the soil. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay, that's all I've got for the questions.